On the topic of giving, um, what should you give that you don't have to give? Love and kindness. You don't have to give it to heart. You don't have to. But what happens if you do get, give up the heart, see? What happens if you give from a deeper place? Yeah. Selflessness. What happens if you know what that is and you don't give? See? Yeah. And what happens if you don't know what that is and yet you give? See? So giving is the way of the heart, but it's not. Negative. It's not giving with a strategy. And that's something we need to be careful of. Why are you giving whatever you give or what you don't have to give? Why are you doing it? You need to see what, what kind of machinery is involved in it, in your case. And if you can then go beyond that, transcend the, the machinery of, of self-doubt and selfishness, say, no, I can give this. Say, maybe I can just give a word here. Say, maybe I can just give a kind thought here. Say, maybe I can give a kind thought of support instead of not. Say, say. Maybe I can do something I don't like to do because it's just going to be good to do it and prove to myself I can do what I don't like to do, which then afterwards I realize I really enjoy doing that. Say, so you're overcoming your own self-conflict and self-limitation programming. From chapter 123, you write, Each being is paradoxically possessed by the greatest possession anyone may have, that is, the Divine Spirit. Mm -hmm. Although it may be said that each has within, on, about, or pervading them, this Divine Spirit, no one really possesses or controls it. Rather, it, when properly cooperated with, does and arranges what needs to be, as distinguished from what is desired to be. My question is, is cooperation always 100% necessary when it comes to being possessed by the Divine Spirit? Or could there be certain circumstances where the Divine Spirit would move one to act in spite of any selfish resistances or obstructions? Well, we're not going to say we know what the Divine Spirit is up to and uh, how it works particularly. But we can say that we, if we understand our karma, especially good karma, chances are we can get a lot more good karma flowing if we got out of its way. So we need to find out how to get out of the way of our own good karma, which when it shows up we say, oh, it's a spiritual. No, it's just your own good karma, you just don't see it. Right? So let's say when a good thing happens to relatively good people, they say, oh, thank you, God, thank you, Spirit. Well, you can do that. But it's already in your bank. It's, it's, not, it's not like coming from any place other than your own goodness. See? From before, let's say. Now, when we're talking about a real spiritual I intervention, uh, that's not like just seeing good things happening necessarily. It was saying a spiritual intervention comes in, and we say it could be very delicate, but it can also be as uh, shocking as like seeing mothership come and land above your head, say, and take you, take you out of yourself, lift you up like you've seen on, um, no, in the movies you've seen this happen. Yeah. You can imagine it happening. So we're talking about something really outside of us, but part of us, see, that's bigger than our self-knowing as such. See, showing up and saying, hey, you, you know, look, listen, this is what's happening now, right? And then if we're looking at it in a certain way, you say, well, everything in my ordinary life just stopped at that moment. This is like not good or bad. This is like shocking. This is astonishing. What is this? And we're talking about a certain kind of intervention of the order of something of the divine, when it really makes its presence shockingly known for a certain purpose, maybe a change in the history of mankind, or change in at least your, your actions, which may affect mankind in a certain way. So we're going to leave it at that level for now. See? So as not to take lightly and wrongly good things that happen to us as if we had nothing to do it and put it on the divine, which may have better, more greater fantastic things to be doing that 
minding over your good karma and whether you see it as such and then taking for granted that good karma is something spiritual which it isn't. You need to own up to your own good karma and keep producing good karma because it comes back in, in its own way see? Yeah. to help you. Yeah. Would the practice of being virtuous be considered an asset or a folly for those who wish to advance on the path to liberation and enlightenment? Um, well, again, we're going back to karma. See? Depends on your karma. See? Depends on conditions. You either inherit it or you created yourself. See, to worry about what comes, whether you are virtuous or not virtuous. Because there are many who are not virtuous and they have all kinds of great things happening to them. See? So we have to accept karmic let's say, wisdom and say, well, there was some good going on there. And now they're showing up in this way. And they're obviously not on the, the positive side of things, but there's obviously good karma, certainly the recognition of how to make good karma for and so. And so it's there. So you have a lot of a lot of those people who are living in I won't say um, you know, the best of conditions, but living under very, very comfortable conditions for themselves, who are, you know, not necessarily of high spiritual uh, intelligence. And you find the contrary. You know, in very simple, even harsh conditions, people are very high intelligence. And that's not a rule. And sometimes you find people of very high intelligence living in very, very auspicious conditions. Yeah. So, but they are separate things. Sometimes they show up one way, and sometimes they show up another way. But for those who are more spiritually endowed, the conditions don't matter that much to them. Yeah. Ordinarily. They can create other conditions, or they can stay with those who have less conditions, and less karma, simply to be a, an example and a demonstration to them. And such would be an act of service and, you know, uh, on their part. It's the beings who are showing some level of leadership. See? And these beings are humble beings by nature. They are serene beings, and if you question them, they'll tell you they're exactly fine where they are, and they don't need any, any exception whatsoever. They are fine, perfect, in fact, it's perfect for them. From chapter 124 you write, to be an unenlightened, virtuous human is to be in conflict with or opposition to vice, but to be an enlightened being is to be perfectly free of the dualistic conflict mm. and limitations of either virtue or vice. Mm. Virtue and vice are of the plane of relative perceptions, values, and conventions, but true enlightenment is of being the absolute light of sound itself. My question is enlightenment a higher, purer form of virtue? It could be. It might, might be the highest form of virtue where your, your state of knowing is so pure. Uh, you bring light to everyone you speak to, if you can do that, you know, depending on you know, exactly what your karma is. So, so the enlightenment is not necessarily a job status. Uh, you can you can have your enlightenment under ideal conditions by monastic standards in terms of the traditions. You can be uh, have an enlightenment experience in Wall Street or in the boxing ring. You know you can have an enlightenment experience anywhere. It's not up to the self to create that. It could be on, uh, under certain conditions, uh, strange conditions, crazy conditions, non-conditions. It's like who knows? But you find wisdom, enlightened wisdom in in every area of life. You know as uh, uh, you know, evidence proves that. You know, people know what the enlightenment state is because they're part of that enlightenment state. It's not because they're not in one culture or tradition or other. We are part of the same intelligence, wisdom, and that is universal and impersonal consciousness throughout the universe, you know, here and anywhere, everywhere. Yeah. So how that manifests through you is whether, based upon and whether you allow it to come through in, in a way that so it's best for you to express it, or easy for you to express it, or or not. So, but everyone is that a wisdom. A, a, anyone can pick up a Dharma book, say a wisdom book, and say, yes, this is true, I know this. 
see, because what they're reading is true to them. See. It is their truth. It's not just one person's truth. It's not the realizer's truth. Certain truths are the truth for all beings. They're just the truth. See. They're just, it is just so that way. See. See. We are that. We are, let's say, that ultimate awareness. We are reality. We're not living in a certain resonance with it that would make it obvious to us beyond a doubt. See? See? We doubt our own relationship to this reality. We usually tend to feel because of our programming as self-limiting beings rather than self-liberating beings. We say, oh, it can't be me, it can't be us, it can't be here, it can't be now. See, it can't be this, it can't be that. See? When it's absolutely all of that. And some. My next question is in regards to chapter 125, which is titled, The Most Precious Gift of All. What is real happiness? It's not happiness. <laughs> real happiness is not the word happiness, that's for sure. So when we know that real happiness is not a word, we have to start thinking deeply about it. See? If real happiness can't be described, then what are we talking about? <laughs> It's an unknowable, so to speak. It's real happiness. Uh, we can say that by certain standards it's peace. Uh, real happiness is, you know, I guess you might say a certain enlightened state of okayness, right? And being okay with life. Uh, say real happiness comes when you are wealthy enough, <laughs> you know, for some peeps. Or when you're miserable enough, say, for others. Say, well, this is real happiness, man. Uh, I have less now. I'm freed up of all my obligations and responsibilities. This is happiness. I don't have anything. I don't need anything. That's the state of the monk, in fact. I don't want anything. Real happiness. Zero yeah, obligation. Real happiness. Total obligation. See? So real happiness is a very mysterious thing. But for enlightened beings, it's not about real happiness or anything. It's not about words. And for intellectual beings, it may be about that. And psychologic beings, it may be about, well, are you happy with what you're doing and with your karma? See? See? How much money you're making? Are you happy with your family life? Are you happy as a household? Are you happy in your business? See, real happiness. Oh, yes, I made $4 million last week. I'm really happy. And if I make $6 million tomorrow, I'm even happier. Well, that's materialism as a game. It's no happiness there. That means you're happy and talking about happiness if you have it. And if you who, who did that lost it, then you would be understandably miserable. So there was no real happiness in your real happiness. It's relative. Who knows? Happy with money? Happy without money. Happy despite all conditions. And happy for no reason at all might be real happiness. Must one be enlightened to experience, experience real happiness, or are we all capable of experiencing mm -hmm. some measure yeah. or a moment of real yeah. happiness? Well, we could be mixing reality there, real happiness and enlightenment, whatever the, these words mean. So, who you speak to about it. We are potentially capable of being happy presently for no reason. Because we are. See? Can you be happy because you are? Can you be happy because you is? Right? Can you be happy because you're breathing and you're actually okay? Can you be happy because you're living right now? In life right now? Can you be happy with being in life? See? With being alive? See? Getting down to the most fundamental level of recognition and awareness and being happy with that Say, I'm happy for no reason at all. I'm happy just to be here. See, I'm, happy, I'm happy not to be here, and I'm happy to be here. See, and you feel this openness, this positive sort of vibration about it. Right, that could be happiness. That could be real happiness. Yeah. Could be. My next question is in regards to chapter 126, which is titled, Take Not More than what is given. Mm -hmm. My question is, what happens when someone accumulates too much karma? 
No, they could implode or they could explode. If we say too much karma, whatever that could be. More than they can handle, which suggests some kind of imbalancement. And some people become imbalanced, too much to handle. That doesn't mean they have too much money, it doesn't mean they have too much this or too much that. But they become imbalanced because they have too much to handle see, for themselves. That's the perception. That may not be the reality, but it is a perception. See, too much to handle. Oh, my life is too much to handle. But your life may be too little to handle. That's why you're saying it's too much to handle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, so you don't have enough to handle of the right things. So you have too much to handle of the wrong things, perhaps, and too little to handle of the right things, see? Yeah. And so there are different ways to creatively view and angle your perception on your particular karmic dilemma or karmic fate or whatever it is, and it's maybe too much BS <laughs> to overload the circuits and obscure the perceptions and cause so much, B well, from so much BS, make profound and silly mistakes misjudgments because yeah. you don't have your heart in the right place your ego is somewhere else your ego is tripping so you are tripping because and, and tripping on your own steps yeah. stumbling on the, on, under the influence of your own sort of let's say baggage say. And so we need to pull back and have a clear perception of what we're really here to do and what kind of image we need to either cause us to fall all over ourselves or to step out of ourselves so that we are happy beings, okay? despite our karma. Mm. Uh, from chapter 126, you write, Too often the attachment one has for another prevents, obstructs, or protects the other from the retributive karma born of their evil actions until one or the other or both pass over. Uh, are you implying that such an arrangement could prevent the other person from developing and progressing <coughs> spiritually if they are prevented from reaping what they sow? Yes, that can be the case. This is a very delicate issue here with parenting. See? When do you interfere and break your, let's say, positive, uh, I guess you might say, uh, resonance with the child because you have to punish them for something that they're learning uh, because of their stage of life and the only way they're going to learn it is if you use force. See? You impose something upon them. So this is something that's carried through straight on up, see, up the ladder, not from children, but in basic relationships. See. And it's, a, a, I guess you might say, a, a toss-up, whether or not you, know, you are enabling a person in a dark way by being the way you are with a person, or disabling a person. See. So you have to make that, that judgment by knowing the person and the situation, knowing what their tendencies are, knowing what direction they're going in and how you are either advancing that or um, balancing that by conscious, uh, let's say, um, relational uh, communication with the person or persons. Mm -hmm. So that's something you have to call as you see it as you go along and you start uh, discovering what's going on with anybody, say, what to do with them. Say. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes relationships act as uh, incubators, say, I guess you might say uh, cookers, right, um, ovens, such to bake, whereas you have positive, but the longer you stay with a person, you start seeing other things, see, which comes as a result of being there over time, so to speak, say. and then you have to deal with that, and this is true in a lot of relationships, and that's why there's a lot of regret in certain relationships, say. you know, I knew I should have bailed out of this a lot earlier, <laughs> because I saw where it was going, and but I stayed because I thought I could fix it, but you overstepped your bounds. And then if it turns into something really toxic and dangerous, then you learn from that. The one you should fix is yourself and your judgments. <laughs>